Hey guys, we are live here at Tantrum Con. Been having a fantastic Woo! weekend. I am joined with the crew from Proto ATL, Steve Avery, Andrew Smith, and Monica Rasso. They run a convention in Atlanta, Georgia. Tell us a little bit about what's going on down there, Steve. It, this this uh, convention is completely about designing, pitching, and networking uh, games. And so we are here right now giving an opportunity to a bunch of designers to pitch their games. We're going to be coaching them along and asking them some questions. We want you guys to join us. Let's get started. <laughs> All right, so first up, we're here with Julio Nasadio. He's got the game Holy that he's going to tell us about. Give us your pitch. Hey, everybody. This is Holy Festival of Colors. It's a game coming out from Floodgate Games very soon, and it's an area-controlled puzzle game where each player is trying to spread as much of their color as they can throughout the town. And this, as you can see, is a 3D puzzle game in the sense of you are represented by a pawn here, and you are spreading your color using these puzzle cards. So as you can see, there's three boards here. So throughout the game, you're gonna be spreading the color on the bottom board, which each one gives you one point each on the bottom board. But throughout the game, you're gonna be ascending to those higher levels. And here's the kicker. When you place tokens on the higher levels, if they're not supported below, they will fall down to the lower ah. levels, so you will lose points that way. So it's not just about making your pieces fit, it's about also fitting them and supporting them. So that is a quick overview of Holy Festival of Colors. It plays two to four uh, players, 20 to 40 minutes, so it's fairly quick. The game also supports some alternative rules that you can always make your game different. And it's a, it's a great one to watch out for. Very cool. Super love the look of it. Really fantastic table presence. Tell us a little bit about the inspiration for it. Well, uh, this is all Floodgate. I mean, Floodgate has done a fantastic job with this uh, theme. They've done all the research to make sure they hit all the right points. This is definitely a, a, a very uh, interesting one in the sense that Holy Festival of Colors is, uh, it has a religious background, so they want to make sure that they do it right. And, you know, cultural appropriation, they don't want any of that, so let's make sure they do it right. And, but for me, in the design part, I actually originated from, from uh, uh, the World Tree as a theme. And using the underground as the roots of the tree and the trunk as the earth and the branches as the heavens. So it, it, it still kept that same hook and mechanisms, but Floodgate brought it to a whole new level with this theme and just this beautiful art by Vincent Dutre. I remember playing this when it was a prototype mm -hmm. years ago. The at, first Proto ATL? Yeah, Proto ATL. And man, it has come a long way. It looks awesome. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I'm really excited. Uh, watch out for it. Uh, It'll be uh, uh, on Kickstarter early 2020. Uh, just so you know, the festival actually occurs around March, so we'll see what happens. Cool. Perfect timing, excellent stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let's move on over this direction. We're gonna talk with John Jewell. He's got his prototype, which I also can't pronounce, Antolia. Anatolia. Anatolia, very close, not really. All right, uh, give us the rundown, give us your pitch. Sure, so in Anatolia, you're Turkish nobles in the early Ottoman Empire. And it's a game where you're doing a little bit of resource management, dice rolling, and the idea is you're, you're trying to rebuild the city of Constantinople after the Ottomans sacked the Byzantines and kicked them out. So we're having a couple of different ways you can win the game. You can either collect trade routes with some of the trading partners of the Ottomans. You can collect resources. You can trade for things you didn't have and build three grand bazaars, or you can get influence in the Sultan's court. So. The way the game is played is each round the Sultan has a problem. We need to rebuild a damaged cistern, we need to protect the borders, we need to re-attract artisans to the city, and you're going to use your dice, which are your workers, um, and you can compete for who, who rolls the highest dice, can get one of the rewards the Sultan has offered. Once you claim that reward, your dice is exhausted and the other everybody rolls again, so you have fewer dice each round, um, okay, or each, each exchange in that uh, in that battle or, or um, encounter. And so uh, what happens is you, you get different cards to upgrade your dice, upgrade your economy, upgrade your politics score, and it plays two to six players in about 45 minutes. And it's, uh, it's actually got some great art. I've covered up a lot of it with um, <laughs> prototype, re stickers. prototype revisions. <laughs> yeah. uh, this is the third complete rebuild of the game since I started on it about three years ago, but I think it's ready to go. Very cool. So are you looking for publishers? Are you taking it to Kickstarter? What's your hopes and plans? Looking for publishers for okay. this one. Excellent. So you've been pitching it in other places? 
Yep, I originally thought I was going to kickstart, but the more I realized that publishers were accessible and amazing, like nice people, they were actually going to talk to me, uh, I realized that I've got something that I can uh, get out there on the market. Very I, cool. I'm excited. I, I love seeing all the dice. I can tell already you're going to have to have some really careful choices when you're starting to figure out which dice you want to go and then, you know, maybe roll poorly and <laughs> have, those big, have those big, oh, moments, you know. What made you decide on that theme? It's a really cool theme. So I love to travel, and I got to spend about 10 days in Turkey, oh, which wow. the landscape, the Tax history, the world. culture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this was, before, this was the first inspiration for a game that ever, ever came out of me. Oh, wow. And so uh, I really just love the historical setting, and the, the landscape is very strange and wonderful. Uh, it really made me want to get some art that captured that almost surreal place. So, I suspect this game won't uh, be out there very long. I think that someone's going to snatch it up. Thanks. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for talking to us. Let's move on to this other side. All right, Francesca is rolling out her game on the board, on the table for us. What is the name of your game? My name is... The, the name of your game? Can you tell us your name, too? Is Wicked and Wise. Wicked and Wise. All right, excellent. Give us the pitch on Wicked and Wise. So Wicked and Wise is a four-player trick-taking game where you're going to be partnered up into teams of two. Um, each partner has an asymmetrical role. One partner is Wicked, and Wicked is in charge of action cards and manipulating the cards that are in play. Um, and Wise is the partner that's doing all the trick taking. Yeah. The partners have to work together in order to get these treasures, which are worth victory points, and they have to work together with limited information because they don't know what cards are in each other's hands. And at the end of five rounds, the player with the most points and treasures wins the game. Man, fantastic. So Euchre is one of my favorite card games. Mm. Does it have any of those types of things going on? You're working with another player who's holding cards. You don't yes. know what they've got. Yes. Where did your inspiration come from? Is it some of that type of game? So it was actually inspired by Spades. Um, okay. I yep. played Spades yep. more. And um, I really enjoyed the partnering element. And I thought that that was interesting because I don't necessarily enjoy co-op. So when I started exploring, what I liked in partnering, um, I kind of developed the idea for this game where two people could have their independent roles but still be working together towards a goal. Very cool. I like the mouse and the dragon action. <laughs> what are some of the other uh, unique cards that we'll find in the game? Obviously, we're looking at prototype art. Yes, yes. <laughs> Tell us about some of the cool tools that they'll get to use. So normally with trick taking, you, you usually start with the full deck. This deck has five suits. Um, but what I do is I separate the trump suit, which is the highest, um, the highest cards, and I separate the face cards. So the players doing the tricks only have access to two through ten of just the regular suits. And then their partner has access to buying the trump cards and the face cards, and they have to kind of feed it to their partner at the right times in order to win their tricks. Fascinating. You're sucking me in. <laughs> can, they, can they communicate for their strategy as far as, like, I'm going to buy this and do that? or Because I know a lot of, like, in spades, there's table talk is yeah. strictly forbidden, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. I've kept it, too, about the table talk allowed in spades, where you awesome. really have to just read what your partner's playing and, and figure out the flow of the game. So it sounds like you can actually take on two different roles. So you can play this game several times, get mm -hmm. good at it from one role, but then... Exactly. Go to th that's that's neat. That's exactly. interesting. Is it two or four players, or <coughs> only four players? Or? Right now, it's only four players, okay. but we're trying to work to get it to play six. Okay, mm -hmm. excellent, very cool. The, the game is signed, or yes, okay. it's signed with Carla Cox. Uh, we're Giraffe Games. Very cool. Do you have a timeline? What are you looking at for? Um, where, where are you at in the process? Uh, right now, we're still heavy in the development because okay. um, it's still relatively new, but we're looking towards 2021. Very cool. Yeah. Do you have artists Excited. in mind, or are you doing art, or where are you, do you have any? She's still talking and okay. trying to figure out artists. Excellent. Yeah. Very cool. We're looking forward to this. Yeah. Thanks so much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Very cool. So we've got hedgehogs going on over here. Uh, give us the rundown on hedgehogs. All right. We'll give you the rundown. Okay. So this is hedgehogs. Hedgehogs is a family strategy game for two to four players. One of the things that's interesting about multi-age uh, strategy games is typically they have a set player count, mm -hmm. and we designed this one so that actually. Uh, scale, so you can play it with two, three, or four. Okay. Um, we play tested the success with players as young as eight and as old as 82. It's been very fascinating. Um, <laughs> no 83, come on. No, no 83. No, no, line. no, yeah. no because. Had to uh, pick a number, right? Yeah, yeah. so it was 82. Um, it's in still in development. Okay. Uh, it is looking to be signed. Uh, it's a game that really only has three or four rules. We've caught me mid play, right? So the basic rules are very simple. Hedgehogs, this is a game of 
beautifying the public gardens. I wanted to make something that was nonviolent, right? Okay. So it's uh, inspired by the flowers you find. We're here in South Carolina. I live in Georgia across the river. These are all flowers and colors that naturally appear in my yard every spring. It's very exciting. So what you do during the first phase of the game is we place these one unit hedgehogs on the board. Now hedgehogs are nasty little creatures that eat plants. And our job as players is to beautify the gardens by placing as many of these flowering hedges as we can on the board given the space. Ooh, okay. Understanding, of course, from an adult point of view, the math won't let us put all of our pieces on the board. So the game changes every time you play it because players choose where to put the obstacles when the game starts. Okay. And then as gameplay unfolds, your object, again, is to get your pieces on the board. And the only rules are you cannot touch a hedgehog and your color can only touch your color. So in this setup that we have here, it's now the <laughs> hydrangea's turn. Hydrangea. I believe so. Uh, I always get those messed up. Actually, the blue one's the hydrangea. I it wrong. This is another H. These are gardenias. You can have, you can have white are, hydrangea. These are gardenias. These are gardenias. Yes, you can, but the soil in my yard turns our white blue. So I could, for example, play this. I can't play this here because it'll. No, I can play that there because it does not touch this hedgehog. Okay. And I am allowed to touch my own color. Right? So again, the game is designed to be. Um, Really easy to learn. Again, there's only three rules. There are some rules variants that make it a little more complex. Um, there's even an alternate board that makes it harder. Uh, but in the end, you score points simply by covering squares. And so the, whoever has the most tokens on the board wins. So you're going for a light, uh, abstract yep. family game. Exactly. It's like really accessible. It's very, very accessible. You can teach this game in about 90 seconds. Um, and a four-player yeah, four player, four play, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> four player game takes 12 to 15 minutes. Excellent. So and one way one way to play it, sorry, is to actually do sort of tournament style. Okay. Where everyone gets a chance to play first, and most points at the end of the game. Works. I so that's a great. I just got the clever name play too. So we're actually hedging right. in these right. hedgehogs. Right. It is in fact uh, it is in fact a pun, and it is, hedgehogs do in fact eat plant roots. That's oh, one of okay. the things that they do, and so they will destroy um, plants in your garden. Cool. How long have you been working on this one? I've been working on this one for about two and a half years. It's funny. I've been pitching this one for about two and a half years. I actually wrote it in about 25 minutes. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I accidentally wrote Blockus first, and then I realized that that was already a game. Yeah, okay. Well, <laughs> we've all done it. <laughs> and then I thought, what happens if you reverse engineer Battleship? Ah, right? interesting. Because in Battleship, you place the Trying ships, and the the ships and then you try to find the ships. And so I said, like, well, what if we put the obstacles down first and then try to place things around the obstacles? And so originally it was all uh, battleship themed, and then I went, I don't want a war game. No, I think I think this you hit the, the nail family, yeah. on the head with a family friendly, light, abstract game that's going to appeal to you know yeah. young young audiences. And the big pitch is it's looking for the right publisher because this is potentially mass marketable. This is something that again, if you're a fan of Blockus, if you play things like Othello, even right. it fits in that genre. So mm -hmm. it's an interesting little niche for publishers if you're looking for something that could go big. I think this is appropriate. Excellent. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I meant to ask all of our designers so far this question, and we'll make sure we get this into the comments, but tell us where they can learn more about your game. You can actually learn more about this game at winged5games.com. I will send you that URL later. Excellent. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much. Let's keep rolling. We'll head over here. All right, so we've got Aaron Stifton here. He's got his game, Tross. Tross. Which I had an opportunity to play just recently. Very enjoyable. Give us your pitch on Tross. So this is Tross Viking Chess. And it is a it's very much in the family of checkers and chess. There's a couple of little twists, however. You don't want to eliminate your opponent's pieces. You want to humiliate because this is a Viking game, <laughs> right? Love it. And so you're moving very much, you know, forward, side to side, that sort of thing, jumping, same as checkers. Um, but you're trying to the, get to this throne area. And you can either occupy that throne with your piece, or you can trap their man on the throne. And there's, it's all diagrammed in the illustrations here. And the more pieces you leave of your opponent on the board, uh, the higher your rank. So the highest rank you can get, you leave all nine pieces, you get the, the uh, level of being a warlord in Tross. So Eliminate all the, the players, game. and you get... You get you denied. Win. You get denied. You lose. Oh, you lose. If you eliminate you all, lose. you lose. You eliminate oh, all. You cause a stalemate. 
You lose. Interesting. All right. yeah, very there's, cool. no, there's no one left to tell the tale about right, Mighty. Yeah. Right. You want to have subjects <laughs> to <laughs> rule over. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Tell a little bit about the production here. This is a prototype. I mean, it's handmade, it looks like. Give this is handmade down. by Twice Live Games' John Dyer at Twice Live Games and uh, all this artwork. So I, I brought this abstract game to him. And he says, oh, this is this is Viking. This feels... This feels like it needs some snakes and dragons, and I was like, "Do your, do your, do your work. Do the magic. Yeah. Do your magic." <laughs> and so he came up with this and a lovely box and everything. So it's great. Um, this was actually inspired by a game I played called uh, Corridor, okay. and all these games, all their games, this particular publisher, they all start with Q's, and it's very simple movement. So I wanted simple movement, but complex strategy. It seems like this is something that's going to take a long time to get good at. Short time to understand, but right. I feel like one of those. To master, yeah. Long time yeah. to master. Yeah. I've had guys sit there and just hold their head <laughs> and then scowl on their face. They don't know what to do. The so. fact that your instructions, basically I know how to play the game by just looking at it. Yes. Like, okay, yeah, I get it. But I can just tell. That's just cool. Jump that's right really cool. Excellent. What's your plans? Are you self-publishing? Are they publishing? Are you looking for Kickstarter? Give us your... Uh, we are trying to self-publish, so we're um, putting out these as quick as we can. Um, it is quite a production, okay. so we're having to make all sorts of tools to make it. Interesting. Um, so we've actually had to slow down our store for this for this run. So this is the first edition. Okay. Uh, we've actually had to slow down our store just to be able to catch up. Cool. So Where is good, that store? Where people find So more? you're gonna go to twicealivegames.com and look for the buy button. Sounds good. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Let's move on over. Here we've got William and Shauna and their game Pet. We had a chance to peek at this just yesterday as well. Give us a little bit of an overview and give us you guys a pitch for Pet. Sure. Well, this is uh, Pet. This is a uh, two to eight player uh, competitive push your luck card game. Uh, it's very light, family friendly. Um, as you can see, it's got kind of a whimsical art style. It's meant to evoke kind of a comic panel look. Um, so the idea is uh, you are trying to pet a finicky cat. Try We've to all earn, been there. Try to absolutely <laughs> try to earn its affection um, by receiving the most purrs and the fewest scratches. So the concept is basically you've all been at somebody's house where you're at a social gathering and a cat walks in the room. Everybody wants to pet the cat. So that's kind of what you're doing. Is you're trying to kind of coax the cat over to you. So you do this by uh, everybody has a, a hand of three cards. Um, you have basically three different types of cards. You have uh, pet cards that have hands on them with certain values. Those values match what we call presentation cards. So this is the part of the cat that they present to you to that be they petted. Get to pet. <laughs> so there are different things like head, back, uh, belly, uh, things like that. So and there are also item cards that basically have a dual purpose. One is that you can coax the cat to do different things. Coax it to hide from another player. So oh, nice. to take that. Yeah. You're right. manipulating the cat. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I would or, get a scratch card if I tried. <laughs> <laughs> or you also have positive item cards like a can of tuna, things like that, where you can draw the cat back out if somebody has scared it off. Um, so basically, what you're trying to do is uh, with your pet cards, you're trying to match the value of the presentation so that you can then pet the cat. Your pet value. So this this pet value, this presentation has a pet value of two. So I have a pet uh, of three, but I have a negative item card. This would be one I could use to scare the cat off if it was somebody else's turn. But here I can use it to subtract one from the value of the pet card. So this is now a two. So now I can pet this cat. And I have to make a choice whether to pet it gently or aggressively. <laughs> so if I pet the cat gently, aggressive cat petter. I get to take one result card from the cat stack here. If I pet it aggressively, I can take as many as match the value of this presentation card. So if I go aggressive, I can take two. Um, so these are the results that you can get from petting the cat. There are three things in here. Uh, okay. There are purrs, which are your victory points. Gotcha. There are scratches, which will end your turn and become negative victory points at the end of the game. There are also a few hisses, which is a warning. It basically means your turn is over, but you don't lose any, any points. Okay. So if I draw two cards, I get a purr. So let's pretend that push I drew your luck a little bit, going for a, a double purr. Yeah. I, well, actually, so that's a good way to demonstrate this, the push your luck component. So I draw two purrs. So my that that uh, segment of my turn is now over. I've used one of my I've used two of my cards. So I now draw back up to a hand of three. So now I can choose to pet again or to stop there and keep these purrs. If I keep going, these are still at risk. I haven't saved these yet in my my victory uh, point okay. total. So if I decide to keep going. 
Um, I could pet the cat again if I have the right value, or if I have a presentation card, I can change the presentation so I can pet a different side of the cat. Okay. So you say there's a lot of take that or just a little bit? There's a little bit. Um, so the take that comes in where if another player has a negative item card, so here's a dog that would scare the cat off, when I'm just getting ready to pet the cat, let's say I'm going to use this wild and I'm going to pet, before I, could, I start drawing results, I could throw the dog down, throw that down and say, run nope. the cat away. What, what do you think the best player count for something like this? Um, for the base game, uh, two to four players is what it plays. I mean, it, it works really well at all of those counts. We have uh, kind of an expansion we've built for it with extra cards that will allow you to, to go up to eight. And we've played it successfully yeah. with all player counts from two to eight. Very right, cool. So you guys are looking to maybe kickstart, maybe publish, maybe... We're still in the exploration yes. phase. Okay. Yeah, we're, we're sort of open to both of those yes. possibilities. And yeah. we had talked a little bit yesterday uh, about possibly doing a print and play. You think you might put this up to see if people were interested in, in you know, downloading a copy and... Yeah, that's absolutely a possibility. We've we've done a lot of play testing, but there's probably still some more play test, some more value in doing more play testing. That'd yeah. be a really good way to. to if we wanted to direct there. people anywhere, what would be the best way? Email or Facebook or is there something uh, where people can right learn now? More? Email. Yeah. Uh, we are going to put up a website. Uh, it's not ready yet, so uh, people can email us at pet p e t at notforhumans dot com. Cool. So yeah, thank you. Right. Thank, thank you. you. Thank right. you. Let's move it on to the next one. Over here, I'm joined by Chad Elkins from 25th Century Games. We're looking at his game, Jurassic Parts. Now, this is actually on Kickstarter right now, correct? Right. Yeah, we're sneaking in. Yeah, all right. <laughs> this is how you do it. This is what it's, it looks yeah, like. Yeah, it's all about the promotion, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, give us the pitch on Jurassic Parts. Yeah, so Jurassic Parts, designed by Kevin Lansing, uh, Flashpoint Fire Rescue, and uh, illustrated by Andrew Bosley, who does Everdell and Tapestry, a lot of other games. This is an area enclosure and set collection game featuring dinosaur oh, fossils. Dinosaurs. So each player is a paleontologist, and you are all, you know, it's a competitive game, so you're all going out to the same slab of rock. What you're trying to do is you're, you have a set of chisels that you will sharpen three each turn, and on that turn, place those chisel lines out into the slab. What you're all trying to do is carve out either a piece off of a side, or you can even carve out a piece out of the middle, uh, and then that piece gets removed from the board. You reveal the tiles that uh, are flipped over, so if you can see on the board, some of these uh, dinosaur fossils are known. You can actually see what's out there and they're all scattered about. Some of them are face down, so you don't know exactly what's underneath. But you'll reveal them, and the, all the people who contribute to the fracture, so if you uh, contribute to that enclosure, that's the people who get to divvy up the spoils of, of what's there. And you do that in player descending order from whoever had the most chisels. So whoever had the most takes half. So you really want to try to be the most, especially in a very large break, because you're going to get half of the hexes that are there. Next place player gets half of what's left. Third place player, half of what's left. So you can see it does start to scale down pretty quickly. It's also, if you see someone trying to go for a big, big break, you can try to cut them off at the pass and carve out. You know, it's, it, get, it can get very cutthroat. <laughs> it's a, uh, for a lightweight family game, there's a, it, it really is a very light surface level. But underneath, there is a lot of, like, of, of ways to push and pull. Uh, the, the math in the game and at two players it is a very head-to-head -head competition But what you're trying to do once you pull those tiles you're trying to assemble them into complete sets of dinosaurs So there are one hex dinosaurs, which are the pterodactyls. They themselves are their own little little complete set You've got two hex tiles lots of raptors three four or five is a big brachiosaurus and points scale accordingly based on that once you complete a dinosaur, you earn a piece of amber. Amber is the currency in the game. This lets you transact with the field leader. Uh, that field leader will give you different abilities to try to bend and kind of manipulate part of the game uh, by either buying fossils from the leader, doing things on the board, etc. That is your currency in the game. Yep, good stuff. I've enjoyed this. I think we actually have a preview video of this on our channel. What is, where are you guys at in the funding process? So it is funded. Uh, I think as of, I think we unlocked a stretch goal while I've been busy. Yeah! Here. Yeah! I think we've got like 11 stretch goals unlocked for it so far. Uh, so it's, it is definitely happening. Uh, we're going to try to have it out in time for summer con season. So it'll be available at Origins, Gen Con, etc. With a retail release probably between the two shows. But uh, you yeah, have until February 12th. We've got some fun promo stuff that's available only, only on the Kickstarter page. We've been making cards with backers. So we've already done one card that was very backer community led. We're gonna do another promo card. There's another stretch goal coming up where the backers give us influence on what should the item cards in the game be. So we have some additional cards that let you kind of function as like special, like one-time powers. So one of the questions that get asked is, 
like why don't the players have asymmetric abilities? It's such a very common question. Originally we were. Uh, once we went into art, we really had such a diverse, like body inclusive, racial, you know, cultural diverse set of characters. If someone really felt connected to a particular character, you didn't really want that character to always oh, have to play that same ability. So what we did was we ended up creating these item cards. So that is your, your asymmetric ability without having it be connected to a particular character. That, that was clever. That's yeah. smart. Yep, cool stuff. So this is my case started right now. Where can they learn more about 25th Century? <coughs> so we're on all the socials, 25th Century Games, uh, .com, Facebook, Twitter, etc. cetera. Uh, Jurassic Parts, not KS, it is TS. Uh, not to be confused not to be with confused. a major motion picture series. Uh, but it is on Kickstarter, very easy to find. I think we're literally the only thing that comes out when you search for Jurassic Parts. Uh, but you can go to JurassicParts.Games and it will take you there automatically, which we talked about before the dot .games thing. Dot .games is a, a domain that exists, y'all. Get so on it. You can actually get go it. out. Go out and if you've get got a game it. and it probably doesn't exist as .com, go get a dot .games domain. Because that way you can just promote a very easy to remember URL that you can just redirect to wherever you're, like, wherever you're, you're at, like, like that you want people to go to, yep. redirect the domain Sorry. to that address. So if you've got a mailing list sign-up page, direct them to that. Kickstarter goes live, direct it to that. Late pledge, direct them to that. Your website to sell it later, direct them to that. Boom, boom. That's how you do it. Bonus info. <laughs> Tip of the day. There you go. Excellent. Thank you, Chad. All right, let's move it on. <laughs> Pretty dates, right? The dinosaurs are still alive. Yeah, we're still sticking with dinosaurs on this one. We're here with Eugene Bryant. And we've got it's all dinosaurs <laughs> all the time. <laughs> right now, all dinosaurs. Give us the pitch on Cracked yeah, Earth. That's right. This is Cracked Earth. Uh, so we're going back 200 million years. This is a one to six player game. It's 30 to 60 minutes. Um, so this is a tile shifting uh, area control game. Um, so what you're all going to do is, is you start with Pangea, and then we're going to slowly, as we go over time, we're going to split it apart and, and go into different continents. So the goal of the game is you want to control the, most, the largest continents with the most dinosaurs, so standard area control. But what makes this a little bit different is once we start with Pangea, there's, there's four things you can do on your turn. One of those is being able to shift the tiles around. Um, so unlike most area control games where you actually have to match the terrain and the islands have to match with each other and the water can't be on this, this you can actually place the tile anywhere you want to. Um, and what that opens up is the ability for the tiles to move around and the image doesn't have to match anymore. So if you're on this tile, for instance, where we have one big continent here, you can actually shift this tile right out. And now you split it, <laughs> and so now we have different continents, and that's the, the main mechanic of okay. the game. Interesting. Um, yeah, the fun part of the game is the, the fact that the, the board is constantly evolving, and even though you might have a massive area control this turn, right. boom, someone's just going to yeah. you know, split it right in half, and somehow I got the part with the volcano, and you got all the... <laughs> 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 uh, I've played this game a lot. Um, so, so that's it. I mean, you're placing your tiles, you're moving your dinosaurs around. There's cool abilities on here that let you, uh, there's pterodactyls that fly your dinosaurs back and forth. Um, there's spinosaurs and things that will actually eat other people's dinosaurs. And you keep going that, there's three scoring periods in these late periods here. There's an asteroid that's going to hit, and as soon as the asteroid hits, the era's over, and everybody's going to score, score points based on what continents they control. That adds a really nice tension in the game because you're constantly like, Ooh, if it just comes up right now, I'm going to score a bunch of points. Yep. And then, oh, they, you just put <laughs> yeah. me on an that, island. That's it. Late game, it's edge of your seat type stuff. Don't draw the asteroid now. Whatever you do. Um, so How it gives players? a nice little effect. It, it is one to six. It has a great solo mode on as well. It'll go up to six. Um, solo mode is flip out cars, and it's basically a game of survival. Um, Age range. I mean, it's got some nice, bright, fun artwork. Right. But it sounds like it's got some meaty strategy. It, what, it, uh, it really does. Uh, we're putting ten plus on the box. Okay. Um, so, so you know, choke on them, yeah, you know, my 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 uh, nine look, year old could definitely play it. These but, look uh, delicious. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean these little candy dino pieces. You know, they add a fun flavor. But yes, they are also very delicious. Very yeah. delicious. Very cool. <laughs> Gold Seal Games. So being published, moving towards publishing. What's your time uh, time? moving towards Kickstarter? So uh, a couple of months, probably late March, early April. Well, the date hasn't been set yet, but cool. it's, it's moving to Kickstarter. And where can we learn more? Uh, GoldSealGames.com, uh, you know, Facebook, Twitter, all the usual social media. Excellent. Cool stuff, man. Good luck. All right. That's great. Thanks all right. You. Well, a couple more. Here we go. <laughs> uh, we're over here with uh, Mondo. He's working on the game Small Town. I got to hear a little bit about this last night. Give us the rundown. Give us your pitch. Yeah, so Small Town's a game for one to five players who play as city council members who have three, a term of three years to work together to try and turn 
a small rural town from dying out. Um, that's the town's been experiencing population decline, people moving out. So players are going to work together to try and bring about, you know, to revitalize the, the town. So um, as you see on the board, there's uh, five neighborhoods that all have five different blocks. The, throughout the game, the, the neighborhoods will go into, into decline or disrepair um, and receive these tokens. And so players take actions to try and wipe, you know, try and remove those tokens and turn the, the blocks around um, and as well as open the uh, small businesses that are, that are in the town. Um, so the central mechanic for actions is kind of the most unique part about the game. Um, so everybody has a hand of cards that you, that you start your turn by spending one card from your hand, and then you can take a card action. Um, so the way that works is you reference the card that you spent, and you can either trade up, meaning you take uh, one card that has a value that's equal to or higher than the card that you played. Uh, for example, spend a two, pick up a five, spend a two, pick up a four. Um, and then you take the action of the card that you draw. So the five different uh, values have five different actions on them. Um, they're things like turning blocks around or adding money to your budget or things like that. Um, conversely, if you have, you, you can also um, spend a card with a, a higher value, for example, five, and take any two cards whose value is less than the, the card that you spent. So you can take, discard five and take a four and a two, or a three and a two, three and a one, any combination of two cards, and you would take both actions of the cards that you draw. So it's, it's very hand management um, driven in that, in that regard. So after the card is uh, selected and the action is taken, the um, next card comes out, and if that card is a, an attrition card, this is similar to maybe like a pandemic, epidemic kind of, kind of card, um, this causes your attrition to spread, blocks to close, uh, and, and businesses to shut down, that sort of thing. So you're kind of working against uh, the cards that come out to try and um, turn the town around. Interesting. Is it uh, cooperative? Competitive? It is. Completely cooperative. Okay. So um, you don't communicate the cards you have in your hand, but you can talk together about your strategy. In addition to the card action, there's also um, different actions you can take, including building a, uh, attractions that cost money from your budget, but they you know, turn around specific neighborhoods or specific blocks. Um, or you can allow chains to be built, chain restaurants, chain uh, pharmacies. So those all um, have an equivalent. So for example, this, this one's a chain restaurant. You can use your turn to build this, which gives you a profit of $3, lets you turn around three blocks, but it automatically closes the local restaurant. <laughs> so um, then you have to take additional actions. Brutal. <laughs> Love it. Yeah, so you have to take additional actions to eventually get that closed and reopen the restaurant. Uh, but yeah, so between that and then uh, additionally, you can, you can um, by insurance, so you spend three dollars flat three dollars to have an insurance salesman uh, block off any one neighborhood. So the neighborhoods are all, are the, sorry, the blocks are all numbered. Um, so if you you know pay to protect the block number one, then any attrition card that comes out that requires that block to close is, is protected. So there's ways to kind of um, you know protect against that, those future attrition cards and that sort of thing. So it plays if it, players win if they can clear the board, um, they lose if the round ends, meaning the deck. Uh, runs out and all of the local businesses are closed, or if they aren't able to turn the town around by the end of the third round. Interesting. And what's your plans for publishing, kickstarting, pitching? What are you? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm 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 looking for a publisher. Um, so still, yeah, I'm this, this putting is, it out there. This is uh, in a contest, or uh, yeah. So this is a uh, finalist in the Geek Way of the West design contest in June. So it'll be on display there, hopefully. Um, See how it goes, but Excellent. I do want to say I don't know if you can see the artwork, but my wife is a is, is my is my my artist staff. She's an extremely talented uh, uh, watercolor artist, so she did the, the board. It um, looks fantastic. Yeah. Art. Where can we learn more? Yeah. So um, I'm on social media. Games by Mondo is my handle. I have a website which is gamesbymondo.home.blog. Home.blog. There you go. Check it <laughs> out. Nice and complex. Soon to be dot games. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to hang out with uh, Andrew Burkett, and he's working on White Elephant. Before we start, i got to say, Andrew's got the coolest logo in the whole with that the whole industry. I, I try. That's right. Andrew's <laughs> Games, the snake. <laughs> yeah. It's that, and for the bush viper in the logo, that's what I have the Eris Games. Um, <laughs> just so everyone knows, I'm a snake nerd. Uh, <laughs> so this game is designed by Michael Mahilsek. He's known as the co-designer of Flotilla with Wizkid Games um, that recently kind of hit off. Yeah. Um, so this is a lighter game than that by a long shot. So in, in the game, uh, you're playing in a white elephant gift exchange and you want certain gifts. So you're going to take two or more gifts from the center pile. There are wrapped gifts that you don't know what they are. So you taking those uh, is kind of risky, but you're going to get these peanut tokens. 
Um, peanut tokens allow you to trade with other players. So if I take really good cards, people are going to take them from me. Uh, you want low numbers, so you want the least points at the end of the game. If you have the most of any set, so say you have the most of these little footballs, um, then all your cards count for one point instead of the listed value on the card. Um, so you're trying to get the least points at the end of the game. There's several different suits. And yeah, that is the basic gist. I'm actually had a chance to play this game quite a bit, and uh, it's a lot of fun. M Michael is a, he's Super really, talented. you're very talented and very clever. But the fun part of the game is you start collecting these sets, and you're like, oh, I'm going to go ahead and take this nine because I think I'm going to have the most of this particular thing. And then towards the end of the game, you start running. The, the peanuts give you a little bit of agency on how, how you can draft the cards. And so as you start to run out of peanuts, uh, you're like, oh, my gosh, I am, I'm going to come up short and score a ton of points and lose out, right? So that's that's the fun part of the game is this kind of like pressure to, oh, do I want to go into this new suit? Look, I can take three of these guys and, and, and they show you how many is in each of the, uh, yep, yep. all right, so like this guy right here has got a range of nine. You're going to, you know, if you don't corner the market on yeah. at least four of those or five of those, you're... Somebody else can get the point. Yeah. That's exactly. where wrapped gifts are scary. You don't know what they are yet, so... Uh, you can also use some trade checks to figure out what this card is, so you can sneak a peek at that. Yep, and then uh, at the end, if you're the last person to take from the round, you get the first player, white elephant meeple, um, and any trade. So when you trade cards with another player, you put the trade chips in the center. <laughs> so the person who gets it last is actually the one that gets it, not the player you trade with. Interesting. Yeah, the peanuts also, if you manage to hold on them, they, they do decrease your score by one point per peanut. Yeah. So that's like another strategy you can go you for. It. It's just like hoard peanuts. <laughs> and like, oh, just, yeah, you bring yeah, down your you score, right? right? Like, Golf score, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's a neat game. Interesting. Tell us, um, well, first off, how many players? It is three to eight. Three to eight and 20 minutes, I'm guessing? Like, yeah. Oh, yep. Okay, perfect. And where can we learn more? And, well, and what's your plan? Is it already published? You, you're publishing I'm it? I'm publishing it, yeah. So I'm going to Kickstarter. This will probably be one of the next ones. I have a million games, so I... <laughs> It's one of the next ones. Coming soon. Maybe not the next one. <laughs> <laughs> so it, sometime 2020, you think? Yeah. Or? Okay. yeah, it'll be soon. All right, so cool. Where can they learn more? Uh, FerrisEntertainment.com or on social media. I'm a Ferris Games and a Ferris Entertainment, so I have all the socials. Cool. All right. Let's keep it going. Hello again. Hello. All right, so here with Julio Nazario, and we've got uh, Marvelous Works. I had a chance to peek at this last year, and it made an impression, which is always a good sign. Uh, give us the rundown on uh, this Marvel game. So this is Marvelous Works. This is a, a worker placement uh, stacking game where each player is part of an artisan's guild and they are working by themselves in their artisan's guild trying to make it the most prestigious by making different items, selling to different nobles, knights, the, maybe the king and queen. But the main hook of this game is that the resource management of the game is done through marble trail puzzling. So, so each... <laughs> There you go. So each player that here actually, like I said, is worker placement, has access to three different locations that where they can go. They can go to the mines to access the different uh, resources. And depending on their locations, if they go first, they get the most resources. And when they get them, they place them. And as you can see, there's some randomness involved there on how they can complete their puzzle. And of course, if somebody else comes in on that same spot, they will get three, but the next player gets two. So there's always that uh, involvement in what am I gonna get when somebody is on their turn. And that's how you gain resources. Then you've got the, the markets, and this is mainly where you would go to sell and buy resources, items, or sell to customers, which give you effects to affect your engine building aspect. Now the cool thing with the markets is that they can only be accessed by players that are adjacent to each other. So. Mm -hmm. That's, the, that's how that works. So these can be accessed by everybody. These can only be accessed by players adjacent, and the forge can only be accessed by you. So there's no taking back your workers. It's about shifting your workers around, activating multiple workers at the same time, and getting that engine building and trying to get the most prestige. And this game plays, uh, at this point, two to four players, and uh, it's about uh, 40 to 80 minutes. Uh, and it's currently a finalist on the Hippo Dice uh, competition in, in Germany. So we'll see what happens, So, but it's still unsigned. So. Yeah, man, it looks very cool. So looking to get a signer. Yes. All right, and you've been showing us some places. I think you were at Proto ATL, is that right? Yeah, yeah. At that time, it was very, very new, but it's definitely come a long way from then. 
So I got, just from a, a philosophical standpoint, I've every single game I've seen you make has some incredible table presence or some sort of funky mm -hmm. uh, uh, component or something. What's what's going on like with that? Why, why are you doing that? Because it's it's attractive and awesome. <laughs> well, and, and maybe that's the answer. Well, no, no, it's not just that. It's just that there are some components when it comes to board games that are definitely underused. Like the box is definitely the most expensive component when it comes to producing a game, and it's just used to protect the game. So I like to use, in this case, the box that give it that potential energy to use the marbles there and, and just feed itself like, like that. And, and you know, a, a lot of my games have that uh, presence factor because I, I like to deal with the 3D uh, design. But I also do some card designs and board designs. It's just kind of, <laughs> it, it's, it's, uh, it's just fun to, to do. That's wild, man. That's it awesome. Looks, it looks excellent. Where can we learn more? Well, I'm on Twitter at Hunasaru, J-U-N-A-Z-A-R-U. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and uh, you can follow me there. I always share a lot of stuff of anything that I'm working on. Cool stuff. All right, let's keep moving. Thank you. We're on round two, lap yeah, two. We're back with John. All right, and I see a coconut. What are we, uh, what are we looking at here? <laughs> so I'm, I'm following Julio's footsteps in all ways. Okay, good. So, Sounds great. Uh, this you guys game, got the magic shirt? Did yep. You <laughs> this game is called Fruit Fingers. It's a silly dexterity game where you and the other monkeys have taken over Bangkok's floating market. Okay. You're trying to steal fruit without capsizing the bowl. So in this game, it's very simple. There's a bowl full of different colored cubes, and on your turn, you flip the timer on a level surface right. that helps. Oh, you what? Balance the bowl, and then you flip a card. It's going to tell you to grab a guava, and it's got a silly rule: left hand. So you grab a guava without knocking it off. Flip another card: mango, orange. Stand on one foot. Grab a mango, and you keep going. You try and get as many fruits as you can without ending the timer or knocking it off. You are clearly very good at this. Although he did back out with the one leg. I thought yeah, he, yeah, yeah, yeah. he didn't actually grab the mango. Well, it sounds like he's got practice. There's <laughs> even a durian, which is worth more points, okay. but you have to go eyes closed. Eyes closed. Ooh. You gotta find it in there? Well, just... it's got a different shape. It's oh, a little okay, crystal, okay. not a cube. All right, interesting, very cool. So putting together a prototype, playing with it. Um, Looking to kickstart, looking to publish, looking to... Looking at uh, a couple of publishers are looking at it, and okay. it's also in the Hippodice Finals. Okay. So um, it's it's just a lot of fun for kids and gamers, and it plays two to a bunch of players. Like, honestly, you can just play this for however long as you like. Right. Uh, technically, it ends when one of the fruits is gone, but it's a silly, lots of laughs. This thing crashes and stuff goes Everywhere. spilling. My friend's kids were playing with it, and he was like, ah, my kids just spilled all the things. The kids are like going crazy laughing. So. <laughs> Good, looks like very a Very cool, very cool. Interesting concept, I love it. Good stuff. All right, I mean, we are rolling along. All right, All right. so we got another one here. We're talking with Tina Tempest. She's looking at the game Lord of the Things. She's not looking at it, we're looking at it. <laughs> Give us your pitch, tell us a little bit about your game. All right, well, I am one half of the duo known as Mortal Frenemies. My friend Kate is the other half, and we design all our games together. Um, and we are indeed Mortal Frenemies. Dynamic Frenemies. duo. Yes. Um, so this game is called Lord of the Things, and in it, each player gets to declare themselves the Lord of something. So you could be the Lord of board games. Okay. You could be the Lord of cities in Georgia. I could be the Lord of long distance hiking trails. Um, it has to be something we're all reasonably familiar with. Lord of Rob. Uh, Lord of Rob. <laughs> okay, very good. Um, and the way it works is after everybody goes around and declares what their lordship is, you start rolling the die one by one. So this is set up for six players right now. So you roll it, and so you get a match, or you don't have any match with anyone. So the next player would roll, and if they got a five, then the two of you would be in a duel. So immediately after noticing your dice match, you have to say, I shall have your, and I can't remember what I said, your board game. So board you have game. to name a board game, and he would have to name a rum. No, I'm out. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I got this. <laughs> no problem. We definitely picked the wrong thing. <laughs> Whoever won um, would get the token from the other player. And it goes around like that. The winner always rolls, so you never have more than you know, two matching dice at a time. Um, so the way the game ends up looking is everybody has kind of a stack of chips in front of them. Um, and the way the game ends is when one player's tokens add up to 15, then that triggers the end of the game, and you have to grab for a bonus token at the oh, end. So if you're okay. far behind... Do the math quick. Yes. Um, 
Now in a game like this, obviously there's going to be some ties or some confusion, or maybe somebody wants to be the lord of winter sports and someone chooses basketball and it's a really winter sport, you know? So one of the players, whoever has the purple die, is always the overlord, and they're the person that gets to rule on ties or so you know, rum category. categories, if yeah. I don't know any rums, like I'm going to say no to that. Um, yeah, and so every category, or every time you play, everyone chooses a different lordship. Um, so some of the more fun ones are, you know, I shall have, or um, Lord of Terms of Endearment. So at one point, my friend and my husband and I were playing, and she tells him, I shall have your baby. And I'm like, no, what? Or you play diseases, and you're like, I shall have your cholera. It's like, what are we talking about here? Um, so you end up saying really ridiculous things. Um, but it's very creative in that you get to choose your lordships, um, and a lot of that is based on what you want to hear. I love how simple and fun that is. That is just such a good idea. <laughs> and I feel like it would be an opportunity to learn things you never knew, right? <laughs> like, That's right. Oh, I never heard of that realm. Oh, I didn't know that that was how you could say nice things about someone else. Uh, yeah, very cool stuff. So tell us uh, where you're, you guys are publishing it? So, yes, we, it to... we did a uh, two short run publishing. We um, hand carved the stamps, stamped oh, all of these, the stamped the nice. bags. I mean, when we talk handmade, we mean handmade. Um, and so we do have copies for sale on our website, which is mortalfrenemies.com. Um, and you can also find us at Mortal Frenemies on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And, but we are, you know, publishing is a lot of work. So if there's a publisher out there that wants to do this, great. That'd be wonderful. <laughs> yeah, this game needs um, to see the light of day. This is a, yeah. it's a fun idea. So how much, uh, the handmade copies obviously have got to be a little bit more expensive because of all the work that's gone. So we have been selling it for $19.99. That's a deal. That is a deal. Excellent yeah. stuff. All right, never cool. mind. Twenty five ninety nine. No, it just went up. up. Yeah. There it is. Oh, cool. Check it out. Thank you so much, Tita. Uh, Excellent. Thank you. Let's go look at one more. Thank All you. right, thanks. <laughs> so mom has got another game for us. We're looking at Color Field. I had the chance to demo this last night. Got some really interesting stuff. Give us the pitch on Color Field. Yeah, so Color Field's a uh, tile laying game for one to six players who are artists trying to create a painting. Um, you start with six tiles on your board. The tiles have uh, different colors on each side. And throughout the game, you uh, are going to draw tiles to replace what's on your board to try and maximize your points. So um, you score points for matching sides of colors to the tiles or the canvas edge that they touch. Uh, around goes five turns, um, you re re draw five and, and replace, and then at the end you'll add up your total score at the end um, based on yeah, what the colors that match. So uh, yeah, I mean it's so it's um, under it's signed by 25th Century Games set to kick Kickstarter uh, this spring hopefully, and yeah. Yeah, interesting stuff. Some of the cards that you reveal will have point totals on them, if I recall yeah. correctly. Oh, we've got one right here with a two on it. So there's different ways to score right. throughout the game. Yeah, yeah. And then you've also got some uh, event cards that kind of come out for the rounds, maybe right, yeah. still so, in development. So there's a uh, yeah. So there's um, kind of game modifier and rule change cards that you can use uh, over the course of several rounds to to mix up the gameplay that uh, change the turn structure, or change the scoring, or add additional scoring elements to that sort of thing. Yeah. So when you're you're when you're placing these tiles, you're matching the colors next to the other tiles and the frame that you're playing in. Right? Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. you play on top of a canvas, uh, and you're trying to match as many of those colors uh, next to the adjacent element as you can. Yeah. yeah. Got some rotations and lots of brain burning action going on. Right. right. I yeah. played this a while back, and I remember sitting there incredibly frustrated because it should be so easy, and it's a like, pick a tile, and you put it down, and you go, it's perfect. Oh wait, no, shoot! It's not, which is like awesome. The really experience, yeah, tiles, yeah, like, yeah. Oh man, I should have done that. No, that's it's, it's uh, definitely got that like once uh, once to satisfy, like build it perfectly, but you quite can't. So oh, no, it's that's a cool little yeah, good tension, yeah, good, good cool decision. Stuff. And you said coming to Kickstarter probably this year. Uh, yeah, hopefully in the spring. Okay, that's in the spring, stuff. check that one out. Thank you so much, man. Thank you. Excellent. Well, let's corral in the middle for just a second, G3. Uh, thank you guys so much. Man, I want to give you guys a round of applause. Congratulations uh, on putting together a fantastic good, show. Good it was. Good pictures. Man, we did a little bit of a tune-up lesson the other day and had a couple folks attend, gave some tips on uh, just how to improve those pitches. Uh, you guys took it to heart, and we it was great to be able to see stuff on the table. Uh, exciting to hear some of these are coming to Kickstarter, are already signed. Congratulations to you guys. Thank you guys for hosting with us, with me so much. It's glad to have you on the show. I look forward to hanging out with you guys at Proto ATL later this spring. What are the dates on that one more time? We are looking at April 30th through May 3rd. There and you, you can learn more about that at protoatl.com or facebook.com slash protoatl. 
all the socials pro ATL. Or just call Andrew. Yeah. Yep. He likes to just call him and ask questions. <laughs> His phone number is <laughs> probably <laughs> late. <laughs> Thank you guys so much for joining us. Hope you guys were able to see some cool stuff that you can get excited about. Be looking forward to these Kickstarters coming soon. Until next time, see ya. All right, so over here we're looking at Imperial Garden from who's our designer? Eugene Bryant hey. and Steve Avery. <laughs> Give me the pitch, Steve, and Steve will ask you some questions. Uh, that's right. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Tell us about Imperial Garden. All right, so Imperial Garden is a uh, kind of a uh, what is it? Tessellation. Um, Tetrisy. Yeah, Tetrisy. Tile Tetris placement. Te yeah, with a wrong. Let me tell you about your game. Yeah, right? exactly. <laughs> that. That. So yeah, the, uh, what happens is uh, you use this rondelle, and these are gardeners for oh, an okay. you're building the Imperial Garden of China in order to score the most points. And uh, you will be able to move any of these gardeners, and whenever you move the gardener, you take that shape plus the the statuary or thing that's attached to it. Oh, right. So like, if you move into this exactly, you move into that's where you'll, you'll get the the. Uh, the white lion and the pond, right? Oh, okay. And then how you score points is you score by the number of different terrain that you touch, right? So like if I place it here, I'm gonna get uh, one for the pond, one for the grass, one for the flowers, oh, for points, okay. right? But um, you're also gonna be holding these cards here with different combinations of terrain that you wanna put together, right? And whenever you score those, they build these icons, and the icons let you buy the more impressive features of the of the garden. Ah, okay. Right, and so you can you can get these kind of chain reactions where you, you know, you build this combination, you score these three points, but then you cash it in to buy this thing, which I can put down here. Engine building action going yeah, on. Yeah, a little bit, and then also the, the um, in addition to the the basic tiles here, the these are all like bonus scoring opportunities. The dragon scores double points when you place it, but you have to build, when you score, you have to build areas that you would be, uh, let's see, legal to play. Like, if I'm able to make a little two space there and I happen to have one of these in my supply, I can drop it in there and get double points. Uh, okay. So he, yeah, they, they score double, this scores a flat eight. Um, these, the lanterns score um, one for each lantern that's already placed. So they, they, Grow and point yeah, right. exactly. And it's, we're all cooperatively building on this one garden. Yeah, and so it, it spans out, builds a beautiful, beautiful garden. I mean, it's um, really visually stunning, in my opinion. Table presence, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but, but everybody's scoring their own points exactly. as you build. You gotta be the garden. best gardener. Yeah. Okay, cool stuff. Where can we learn more about this one? Is this still in your head? Are you pitching it right now? Yeah, we're pitching we... it right now. Actually, okay. it's not. It's not actually out in the wild yet. So, okay, so prototype stage. Yeah, it's prototype stage. And very soon, we'll probably put it up on our, our website. Uh, but, um, geez, what is our website? I don't even know. <laughs> Steve dot game. Do we have a website? <laughs> not yet. Not yet. Not yet. All right. So where can we find you on social? Oh, uh, look me up on Facebook. Yep, Steve, Steve Avery. Avery. Yeah. Got it. All right, cool. Good luck. Thank you.